That's only because I, I made a mistake and forgot to write port 8080 in the URL. I just fixed it on my screen. So if you decided to use the training lab instead of Dojo or whatever you would plan to use in this course for a training lab, if you decide to use my Wi-Fi training lab, this is the right address, okay? It's HTTP uh, 192.168.0.109, port 8080 slash webgoat. W capital letter and G capital letter, okay? That's the right address. It's slow, but it will work, okay? We have a couple of training labs here because we didn't know which uh, devices you'll bring. We didn't know if it would be Mac or Linux or Windows or something weird. And we didn't know which configuration device computers will, uh, uh, you know, which configuration you had in your BIOS, the window virtualization flags or not, we came prepared for each eventuality. So there's a couple of training labs. There's the Wi-Fi that you can connect to, the training lab Wi-Fi, you can connect just to your browser and zap and work in front of it. That's good enough for the purposes of the course. That's the worst case scenario. It's not ideal, it's for somebody that has nothing else working for him. He can't install anything on his PC, or he can't uh, uh, run the virtual machine, okay? My main recommendation is using the two following uh, uh, training labs. A, for the first phase of the course, if you can import the Web Security Dojo VM to VirtualBox, that's the most preferred option because all the tools there are already configured. So even if you have problems following through with our various configuration instructions, it should work out, okay? You should be able to use the tools at least in there, both Burp, Zap, or whichever tools you decide to use later on. And uh, the second preference we have uh, already provided you in the Discon keys, uh, the WebGo training kit for your own PC. It's simply an executable jar. I'm going to show it to you just for a moment. Generally, yes, just a second. That's a jar file, web gold container. Jar, almost the same one for all operating system. And just by double clicking it, it should work and already automatically open port 8080. You won't see it do anything. It won't open a browser, won't see a pop-up window. Just double clicking it will open the actual instance. If you can't double click it or don't have an association between Java and Jar files for whatever reason, after installing the JDK, you can simply go to the directory WebGoat is located in, cd into it in command line, and press and to simply execute the following command, java minus jar and the name of the file, WebGoat, jar, whatever it is, okay? That in the actual path the file is found in, okay? That should execute WebGoat and cause it to listen to localhost port 8080. Okay? Localhost port 8080. Let's see if it's working for me. Let's give a shot. There's the training lab. Let's see localhost. is listening to 8080 as well. I get it. So we'll get to conflicts with ports in a second. In general, various programs that you have may listen to various ports, but sometimes two programs use the same port address. If that's the case, you'll have collisions and you won't be able to access or uh, initiate one of the programs, okay? To avoid that, let's go to a simple configuration session in both Zap and other relevant platforms, okay? Let's start by configuring OWASP ZAP. As I mentioned before the break, I wanted to start the session 
with OSP ZAP open on your PC. Not in Dojo, in your PC, okay? In Dojo, it's already perfectly configured. I want to make sure it's working well for your own station. We want to make sure that ZAP doesn't listen to the default port of 8080. The reason we want it not to listen to 8080 is that almost any other generic software listens to 8080. Tomcat or uh, one of our training labs, WebGoat, also listens to 8080. If we use this port in our proxy, we'll have endless conflicts. I highly recommend configuring another port that is typically not used by any other program. I typically recommend 9999 or 9998. To configure ZAP, to listen to another port, I'll just magnify my, uh, my font so you'll be able to see it properly. I can already see that it's not visible. Oh, font size minus one, very effective. I'll just to start zap and let's hope you'll be able to see it more clearly. I'm guessing that's better, maybe even too big. Yep, maybe even too big. We'll reduce the size later on. For our purposes right now, it's good. Tools, options. Under options, there's an option called local proxy. There's an option called local proxy. You should see it somewhere around the middle lower button, okay? Local proxy. It defines the port that ZAP is using to listen to, okay? The port that you should connect your browser to. So by default, it's 8080. Either change it to 9999 or 9998. In my case, I typically use 9999 for burp and 9998 for ZAP whatever you prefer. Just remember that port number because you'll have to use it later on when you configure your browser to use the proxy, okay? Do that right now. Change the port number to 9998 or 9999. After you have configured the port in ZAP, just press OK. Tools, options, local proxy. Those of you who don't remember, tools, options, local proxy. We want to be able to configure our browser to work with ZAP, okay? Now I'm going to have to insist that you use Firefox if possible. However, I'll show how to configure it for other browsers. I'll start with the easiest method in Firefox. If you noticed in the installation, in the installation uh, disk key, in the directory that you copied, there isn't just Firefox, there's also a plugin of Firefox called Foxy Proxy. That's how the file looks like. Foxy Proxy standard. See that? Should have it in the installation disk key. Now, I want you to start Firefox and drag and drop that file into it. Okay, let's hope it works. I actually have Foxy Proxy, so I haven't tested it myself. You should get, you know, an installation notification. Let's see if it works. If it's not working for you, don't worry. I'll explain how to use it without it. It's just more convenient. You should see a pop-up like that. Click Add, and you're good. At the end of the drag and drops part, after you install Foxy Proxy, the Foxy Proxy extension to Firefox, you should see a small Fox icon in your browser. All this is, is just a very, very convenient method to switch between proxies. That's it, okay? We want to be able to switch between being in non-proxy mode to proxy mode, okay? And also to be able to configure proxies really qu quickly. For those of you of, uh, uh, you know, Fans of other browsers, that's fantastic. There's uh, Foxy Foxy extensions for Chrome, IE, and other browsers. 
But, you know, for our purposes, let's start here. After you drag and drop uh, the extension, installed it, and right-clicked on the, fo uh, the Fox icon in Firefox, go to Option and press Add New Proxy, okay? Click the Add New Proxy. I'll repeat that because I'm guessing that most of you will uh, need me to repeat it at least once or twice. After you drag and drop, after you installed Firefox, and after you drag and drop the Foxy Proxy standard extension into it and press Add, okay, you should have dragged and dropped it inside, press Add, and then restart Firefox. After you do that, you should see the Fox icon on your Firefox. Is there anyone here that has a problem with it? Raise your hand, Roy will uh, come and help you out with it. Okay, if there's anyone that has a problem, just raise your hand, okay? So, eventually, just right click on the Fox icon, press options, and add new proxy. In the add new proxy configuration, I want you to write localhost, okay? Either localhost like that, or 127.0.0.1. Same thing for us. And the port that you chose when you configured ZAP, either 9999 or 9998, depending on you, okay? That's what I want you to write down in the proxy details. Don't check any other flags. Don't touch anything else. Localhost 9998. After you do that, swap to the general tab, or you know what, you don't even have to do that. Just Keep it like that, localhost 9998. After that, you can press OK. And you should see the proxy configuration when you right click the uh, Fox icon from now on, okay? Should see localhost 9998 that you configured. And that's it, you want to switch working with Zap? All you have to do is right click the Fox icon, click localhost 9998. You want to stop working with Zap? You can, no. Just completely disable Foxy Proxy and then you're straight in front of the internet. Very effective, very easy to use. Okay? Now, let's do a test drive. I want you to access a website which isn't in SSL. Okay? A website which isn't in SSL. I'm doing some small commercial here. Don't be alarmed by it. HTTP www.techapi.com If you have another non-SSL website, that's fantastic. Just configure your browser to work instead of it, in, in front of it, okay? And access this website, HTTP, whatever it is, which isn't in SSL. You should see in Zap the communication to the website. You should be able to see the communication to the website that you accessed. If it's an SSL website, it won't work, okay? We haven't yet configured Zap to work with SSL. But at the moment, clear text HTTP website should work perfectly. Take a minute or two to set that up, okay? Just a minute or two. In the meantime, I'll try to explain how to use Zap in Web Security Dojo. Again, if you have questions, raise your hand. One of the instructors will join you. Oi, anywhere? Roy, we'll get to you in a second, okay? Okay, so, um, <coughs> Web Security Dojo, and I'm switching from uh, your local Zap instance which you used, is the platform that you're going to use for most of this course, and it's special because it has a bunch of tools and a bunch of training platforms built into it. Now, at the upper left section of Web Security Dojo, you'll see some sort of weird uh, blue icon, okay? If you click it, you'll have various menus, okay? The menus that are specifically interesting to us are targets, and tools located at the bottom of the menu, okay? Now, tools is simply a category of various hacking tools that exist within the platforms, and targets is a variety of 
targets to hack various vulnerable websites, okay? Under tools, you'll see OSP Zap, okay? Zed attack proxy. Zap issues of Zed attack proxy, okay? That's the tool. So you can activate it simply by clicking that button, okay? So button at the upper left corner of the screen, the blue button, tools, Zed attack proxy, okay? Click it and activate it in your virtual machine right now. Accept the license concerns, license no. agreement, and Zap should start any moment. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an updated version, which is good, because we want to sync the versions in the, the PC with that for the purposes of our training session. Uh, after starting OSP Zap, in Web Security Dojo, those of you who have Web Security Dojo, start the Firefox proxy in Web Security Dojo. The Firefox can be started simply by using the Firefox icon at the upper left corner of the virtual machine, okay? Click it, it should immediately open up to the main page, which includes links to all the vulnerable testing application in the virtual machine. There's a bunch of those, 10, 10, uh, 10 at least. We'll be using primarily Insecure Web App, WhatsApp, and a couple of others if we'll get to that, okay? But eventually, that's, those are the applications you're gonna hack. Every application here, just to start hacking it, you just have to pick it up, you just have to click the, the right name in the, in the main menu. Now, instead of using Foxy Proxy, there's a nice plugin here called MJ, or I don't know what its real name is, but it's found in the uh, upper left corner that enables you to choose the proxy that you want to use, okay? So, in Web Security Dojo, Zap is pre-configured to listen to port 0883, okay? 0883. To work with Zap in Dojo just Pick that option. You should see MJ on the left becoming red. Okay? See MJ on the left becoming red? That means that there's an active proxy and the browser currently is working with uh, the proxy. To disable the proxy, simply click that icon, the red icon again, should turn gray, and you're good to uh, you can access the internet without the proxy. Click it again, it's going to work with the proxy you chose. To switch proxies, just pick another proxy. That's pretty much it. Easy, convenient, should work. To make sure it's working, those of you who have the VM installed and Zap active, click Insecure Web App and see that there's traffic in OSP Zap. Make sure that you see traffic, you see that the tree is populated with content, okay? Like that, it's not blank and empty anymore. So, if you follow through my steps, you should have, by now, have Zap installed on your station, and you should have a Foxy Proxy installed in Zap, and you should have been able to access the internet and see some content populated in Zap, at least in HTTP websites, okay? If you want to use Zap to access a training kit from your PC, we'll get to that in a second. If you want to use Dojo, that's fantastic. You can use Insecure Web, Web App for the various training kits and labs, okay? Now, as I mentioned earlier, you, should, you all should have received uh, the training kit, uh, and in the training kit, you should have found the uh, WebGoat file, the WebGoat jar file. Those of you who haven't done it yet, after configuring Zap to listen to another port, and after making sure that Tomcat, if you installed it, is down, if you don't know how to make sure Tomcat is down, there's a software that should be installed in your computer called Monitor Tomcat, I don't have it here, but Monitor Tomcat, you should open up an icon, you can see if Tomcat is up or not. Only if you disable Tomcat, if you installed it, and you change Zap to another proxy, will the following process work. You should be able to double click on the WebGoat container, 
okay let's just close all the boxes here to make sure it's working I'll show it to you to make sure it's working for all of us clean any excess Java processes now I'm clean I don't have any Java processes I'm going to start zap we should listen to port 9998 in my case at least and then I'm going to execute the web go jar either executing it by double clicking on it or by running java minus jar and the name of the jar file after installing the JDK of course that's it you shouldn't see any pop-up there shouldn't be any browser opening up nothing if you want to verify that it's actually working you can uh, run the following command in your command line window net start minus nn find str listen it should open up a listening port on 8080 okay accessing the web boat url that you accessed in the remote lab will now be available you can access it in your own pc http localhost port 8080 web goat should be slow but should work i hope see okay so even if you don't have a vm and you can't connect to the wi-fi just installing zap configuring your browser and double clicking on the web uh, the web go jar file will help set you up with a training kit for the purposes of our course okay all of those methods should work out for you if you have any issues with those methods no problem will be available throughout lunch in the beginning of lunch during lunch after lunch to help you out set to help you set it out for the rest of the course i really need you to uh, get this working so you'll be able to participate actively in the course okay now after we explained the toolkit and we explained the protocol i think it's about time to start talking about attacks right I mean, this is a hacking course. You don't want to learn HTTP debugging or anything. So we're going to start the actual real content for the course, which is web hacking. So we're going to start and talk about two very simple and very common attack methods. Forceful browsing and parameter tampering, OK? Forceful browsing and parameter tampering are two methods uh, pretty much universal that either relate to a lack of security control enforcement or are related to misunderstanding on the developer's part of what the client should be able to affect, okay? Now, when I initially started, in security, that's the thing that dazzled me most. How many, how many uh, unintentional parameters with very significant business values are being sent from the client side to the server side? As hackers, eventually, the whole purpose or the whole method of hacking is to manipulate stuff being sent from the client to the server. If something is being sent from the client to the server, I can intercept it using a proxy or some other methods, change it and send it to the server. However, if this value is significant for the server side, okay, this value can affect major elements in the business logic and therefore can be abused. So the following example is from a real website which I won't name or refer because that will lead you to abuse it. Okay? It's a website that deals with renting cars that's as far as i'll go okay and for some bizarre reason their user interface allows the client to send the price of the car rental from the client side so in the purchase i mean when you actually order when you book the car you if you intercept the http request in verb or zap or whichever interception tool you'll see currency, total price, basic price, and the number of other parameters you can manipulate to, you know, book the car at zero cost, or negative cost if you want to get reimbursed, or, you know, whatever. And 
Actually, that's the second version of the website. The older version of the website actually had a discount field with a value between 0 to 100. Okay? So, that may seem rare, but it's actually not rare. The, I think it's the second test I did in Pentesting, somewhere in 2004 or 2005. I saw a parameter called a privilege level equals, I think it was 5 or 1, or it was 1, something like 1. Privilege level equal 1. 2 didn't do anything, 3 didn't do anything. Changing the parameter to 5 got me an admin interface. So those various flags with business significance are everywhere. In courses throughout the years, uh, you know, in courses in which I have more, had more time, 3 days, 4 days, 5 days, I would actually let the students pick websites, typically e-commerce websites, and look at the parameters. You would be amazed to see the things that you see prices and flags and coupons equals false or true and other elements that really affect the business logic in the, in the server side. Once had a, a student they picked a credit card company, a major a credit card company in IL, and I won't name it because I want, don't want to you know, get in too much trouble these days, uh, I'm trying to avoid it. So there was actually a flag in an HTTP header called customer ID. It was a numeric flag, and changing it to another number got you the entire information of another uh, customer. It will actually allow you to change anything for that customer, complete impersonation. Just because a value with business significance was sent from the client to the server side. Okay, I'm going to demo, I will try to demo something related to it, but just to get us on the same page. There's various parameters being sent from the client to the server, and there's no real uh, going around it. There's no way to avoid it. The client needs to send some into the server in order to create some sort of dynamic interaction in the application. However, the developer can choose which parameters the client should be able to send, or which parameters it's too dangerous for the client to be able to send. As hackers, we can typically manipulate a couple of categories in terms of business logic manipulations. I'm going to categorize it, although there's more categories. In order to simplify it, we'll deal with five or six categories. We'll talk about numbers, anything related to numbers sent from the client side, which is a number used for calculation, can typically be abused with, a, with emphasis on prices, quantities, and sums, okay? A few examples, notepad examples, okay, and later web code examples, which you're going to do on your own in the lunch break. Um, let's say, for example, that a price parameter is being sent from the client side to the server side. What can I do? It's a trivial question. I can reduce the price and send zero instead. I can do a, I don't know, send a negative sum or whatever. Let's say I'm doing a wire transfer in my bank from myself to you, okay? I can send a positive sum, like 100, and I can send a negative sum. Now, if you think about it, when the bank subtracts the transfer sum from your account, it does whatever it is in your account, minus the sum that you're transferring. Now, if you're transferring a negative sum, it's minus minus 1, which in mass equals plus, plus right? So you're getting a gift and the other entity is contributing his, you know, sum to whichever great cause in Africa, okay? So you got the point. Now, one of the instructors tomorrow, Irene, those of you can see, you can check her up. I saw her does, do that once for $60 million, two other variations, not exactly like I described, for a major bank. Not now, you know, it was 2006, 2007, but it worked. That's my point, okay? It's insane, but it works. It's very hard these days, but you never know. Actually, in my case, I saw it working in some bank's website in the last two years, okay? It was fixed, by the way, don't worry, but all I'm saying is that those instances happen from time to time. Quantities, another example, let's say, you want to buy something at a lower cost. So I can buy five products which cost, I don't know, 100 bucks each, okay? And then I can buy another minus three products that cost, I don't know, 150 bucks, okay? Yeah, okay, so I'll uh, switch it. 
It's nothing to see, it's just a notepad. I'm just, you know, trying to help you get a graphical image, okay? So, imagine it. So, if I mess with the quantity field, which is something that exists in any online web store, even secure online web stores send the quantity from the client side to the server side, they have to let you, you know, set the number of products you want to buy. So, you can actually mess with the quantity field by sending a negative sum instead of a positive sum in addition to positive sum transactions. The overall sum that you'll have to pay would be reduced. You can't be, I don't know, plain stupid and buy minus three products. That would simply not get you, you know, you, you can succeed with it, but it's very rare. However, buying five products and minus three products and actually affect a, a sum and may cause it to be lower, it will still be positive, and you might actually get the shipment, okay? Which I saw certain entities get, not to mention their name. Um, so, um, that's numbers. That's not as common as the second entity which we mess with in parameter temporary, which is identities. Identity is any parameter that signifies the identity of an entity. Okay? So, an ID card sent from the client to the server, an email sent from the client to the server, a user ID sent from the client to the server, a username, and so on and so on. All of those values are identity containing parameters. It's a parameter meant to signify the identity of the user to the server. Now in the login phase, that's fine. The user sends a user password combination or an email password combination. It's not that he's able to send the username of somebody else. He has to guess the password of someone else. But if you see the username being sent in the application in an internal page, which is in the login, registration, or password recovery page, it's probably vulnerable, okay? So, if you see a username, for example, in an internal edit page, it enables you to edit your image, you can simply send the username of another user and change his image. Um, another instructor tomorrow, Gil Cohen, I used to mess with his account for a long, long time. I used to change his uh, image in social networks. I'm not sure I ever showed it to him, but you know, it works. That, that's, that's the main point. So, any identity signifying parameter that you'll see, uh, you can intercept and send the identity of someone else. So, for example, if you saw a parameter called username equals, I don't know, you saw a parameter called username equals something in the, in the URL, let's, see that, let's say that's http website.com slash page dot jsp for example username equal danny and your danny you just logged into the website and that's i don't know a page that does something in the website such as edit details you can change that username to admin or to another user account and impersonate that user account throughout the website or throughout the specific vulnerable page okay so that's the second type of manipulation we can use it's important that you listen because you have to do it immediately after the explanation, okay? It's important, okay? So, identities is the second type. You can use identity manipulation to impersonate users, to bypass permissions and restrictions, and generally cause havoc in various identity and authorization elements. The third entity is flags, and flags, unfortunately, are much more common than the rest. Flags can take any form, especially in e-commerce website. You'll see coupon equals false. Let's say you want to get that big discount, you'll write, just rewrite it to true. Just intercept the request, change the flag, the input parameter to true, and you'll be able to get whatever benefit you'll get from the coupon, okay? You'll see discounts, you'll see is admin, you'll see, you'll see role equals simple user. You can change that to admin. You'll see various flags with important significance sent from the client to the website. Now, I encourage you, either through the, throughout the lunch break or you know, once you get back home today, to use the proxy, access, uh, not OSP, ZAP, access the, you know, 
The uh, price conversion application, Zap, you should all be familiar with it in some extent. And try surfing throughout the various e-commerce websites there. I don't know, go buy air conditioners or go buy whatever. You should take a look at the parameter being sent from the client to the server. Just so you see how the world really works. Just to figure out that everything you thought was, you know, generally secure because there was a necessary web a sign on the website isn't necessarily so, okay? And actually is most likely isn't so in many, many cases, okay? So I encourage you to do that at the end of the day, but for our purposes, I want you to take a look. I'm going to stop right now with the presentation. I want you to access either WebGoat or Insecure Web App right now. I actually recommend WebGoat for this specific exercise. So either connect to the training lab Wi-Fi and access the WebGoat URL there. That's the URL, okay? Or double click on WebGoat in your own PC and log in. You have a username and password in the main page. Simply write them down. Guest, guest, okay? Login, there's various attack categories in WebGoat. I want you to select the parameter tampering category. Using the local instance will typically be much, much faster. Okay? For those of you who don't have access neither to local instance or the Wi-Fi, don't worry, I'll explain it in... Uh, yeah, I know, I want to guess, in, uh, I want to guess in, yeah, my health reasons, let's see if it's working. That's the parameter tampering categories. Go to exploit hidden fields, okay? I'll mark it, you'll be able to see it. Go to parameter tampering, exploit hidden fields, okay? There's a web page here, and if you configured your proxy, I don't want to show it to you, I want you to experience it yourself for a moment. If you configured your proxy, if you configured your browser to use the proxy, and you're going to surf WebGo through your proxy, activate anything, purchase, update cart, whatever, and see what the proxy contains right now. Okay? Do it for a moment. See what the proxy contains right now. Go to the tree of requests in your proxy, to the domain localhost 8080, you should see it in your proxy. Let's see. I don't have a proxy, funny. Okay, I see there's a problem here. Let's see. No? You should see the requests sent in the proxy both in the tree and more importantly as a request in the history tab. Okay? See that? The history tab. You should see the request being sent in the history tab. If you go to the request tab here, you should be able to see the various parameters sent if there were any parameters sent. Okay? Let's do it again. Let's update our cart. Update cart and purchase. See that? I'm switching fast. There will be one post, one or more post requests that includes parameters. You should be able to see a couple of very interesting things there. Just note for yourself what are those interesting parameters that you identified. We'll compare it in a second.
Roy, can you raise your hand? Can you stand up? Those of you who have issues can access Roy. Uh, it's in there. Just raise your hand or, you know, grab him once he's free, okay? It's uh, one guy, and I'll be helping throughout the break. Don't worry if you're uh, missing out. Just listen, okay? In the meantime. So. The setup of the web goals? Sure. Uh, ah, sure, 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 of course. Uh, in web goals, you should go to. See? You should go in web goat. After you logged into web goat, it's guest guest or web goat, web goat, doesn't matter. Go to the lower section to parameter tampering here. Click it and go to exploit hidden fields. Let me magnify that for you. Oh, yes, I see. There's a problem. Okay. Who called me? Yes. Yeah, I see. I'll, uh, I'll just... Uh, how about now? How about now? Is it better? Just... We don't see all those menus. In web world? Mm. So, what will be with you in a second, okay, to help you out? If you want, if you want a cheap trick, okay, try writing the link manually. The end work, okay. So, what will be in a second, okay? Oh, a couple of minutes to be more uh, realistic, okay? So, you should have seen, those of you accessed it, you have a training, you, you should, you, uh, your exercise will uh, include a couple of tasks, and one of them is to actually exploit it, okay? You should have seen the following parameters, okay? Once using the shopping cart, okay? One of the parameters that was sent in the shopping card is the quantity parameter, which we already discussed what we can do. What can we send with it? Anyone? Don't be afraid to shout. Change to negative, right? Or buy a couple of things with positive and then and add a couple of negative values, okay? And you also see that there's another interesting value, which is the price, which is very funny because I, the customer, tells the dealer how much the product, is co how much the product costs, okay? Which is obviously something that can be abused. So that's a good parameter tempering example. One of the tasks for the lunch break, okay, and we have very little time to exercise this day, so I'm going to steal as much as I can from your lunch breaks and other breaks, uh, is to exploit it. Remember the task, don't do it now. One of the tasks is to exploit it, is to buy something at the lower product, lower price, complete the transaction with actually, you know, with actually doing something which is malicious, buying something at a low rate, buying at negative, negative rate, whatever. Exploit that feature in, a, in, a, in the application. Now, getting back to a parameter tampering, another form of parameter tampering which still works even in very secure websites in 2017, simply because it's a tedious job to secure it, is resource identifier manipulation. OF has a fancy name for it. Uh, I think it's insecure direct object reference. That's the official OSP name for it. It's good, you know, I'm uh, working for OSP right now, so I won't say anything about it, but it is a bit more complicated to understand. The point is, Entities in an application have their own private resources. You and me, we can be users in the same bank with the same privilege level, but I have my account and you have your account. I have seven accounts of my own, I don't know, each one of them with their own identifier. You have two accounts of your own, okay? We also have other resources that are our own in the bank. We can have a trade account, an investment account, we can have check numbers, all of those are associated or owned by specific entities, okay? To tell the application, to instruct the application to present or edit a resource, the client typically sends the resource identifier to the server. When I want to tell the banking application, hey, present me the transactions I have in my account, 
I'll typically need to send my bank account number to the application in a parameter. So a page that presents content of a specific account website, in a website, it will, you know, will typically send 4444 in an input parameter to the website. But what you can do with resource identifiers is to send the identifiers of someone else, okay? Send the identifiers of someone else. That's really fantastic because, you know, you can do a lot of things with it. You can, for example, when, oh no, when you're uh, accessing an account, just access an account of somebody else, or when you're telling the application which account to bill, you can give the account of someone else. Even better, okay? You can access, uh, well, you know, you guys remember in earlier instances of Facebook that you had a parameter in the URL that had a number? What was that? You remember that? It was an identifier and uh, this identifier was also set in hidden parameters in other pages. But in theory, I'm not saying it worked, I'm not saying it worked, if you would have taken the identifier of someone you viewed the profile in, you could have used the identifier in other locations in Facebook in which there was a hidden parameter that set that identifier. For example, the edit profile page. Okay? But you need the, the session number. No, you don't. I'll explain. Session is generally associated to an identity. That's true. We haven't gotten to session. I'm not sure we'll be able to cover sessions in this page. However, when a developer accepts a parameter from the client side, he typically relies on that parameter. Otherwise, why would he re receive it from the client side? Does that make sense? Unless the developer is sending values he doesn't, he isn't using from the client side, and no, an unnecessary practice really, when you see a parameter that includes identity, even if there's session, the developer may, by mistake, ignore the session identity and use the client originating one, okay? It's not something that occurs everywhere. Every flow in security is dependent on developer mistakes, but it is a common issue, okay? Um, okay, so that's resource identifiers. I'm going to demonstrate, you know what? I'm not going to demonstrate anything. I'm going to help you identify it yourself in a short exercise of, I don't know, how about 15 minutes, okay? Those of you who don't, don't have a VM image, I highly, highly, highly encourage you to sit by somebody who has because there's no other good example of parameter tampering like that. We're currently searching for resource identifier parameter tampering in the application Insecure Web App, okay? I'll help you out, we'll start from scratch. To get the training application started, the testing application started, I'll simply open Zap in Web Security Dojo. I click the button, go to Tools, go to Z-Attack Proxy, Zap, okay? I'll start Firefox and make sure that Firefox uses Zap as the interception proxy in Dojo it's not like Foxy Proxy, you have to click the button on the right, on the left side, pick the attack proxy and make sure it's red, okay? If that proxy is already started here, you should press yes, yes, start, start to whichever question is, is asking you and eventually access the insecure web app link. Ignore update instructions by that, by the way. Uh, insecure web app link, okay? You should see Zap being populated with requests content, okay? So the login information, you can use one of the following users. I'm going to write it down, write it down. The URL, you don't have to know the URL, just open up your browser, open up a new Firefox window, open up a new Firefox window, I'm going to close this Firefox instance. 
open up a new Firefox window and you should see insecure web, web app as one of the options, okay? You should see it here. Close all the Firefox windows that you have, open a new one, you should see it here, okay? Instead of just you know, writing down the actual URL address, much easier. You can easily either use the user A. Smith and Andy. If you want to get straight to the point, I recommend use the following payload instead, or one equals one. It's important that you guys get used to using payloads, even if you don't understand them yet. Much better. Quote. Or quote one, quote equals quote one, just as I wrote it. Don't anything below, before or after. Either that or ace with Andy. Your purpose is to identify a web page in the application that sends a parameter to the server, from the client to the server, that includes a resource identifier. Report ID, account ID, whatever you find, okay? Go to the various links in the application and see in OASP ZAP, see the parameters being sent in OASP ZAP, either in the URL section or the body section. A. Smith, Andy, just to show what I mean, there's various websites, there are various links here, preferences, products, whatever, okay? Find the link that use an account or product or report or whatever identifier and try to abuse it to access another person account, okay? Now, we haven't learned interception with Zap yet. We haven't learned how to intercept requests and change them, but you don't have to. The parameters in Dojo at the moment in the insecure web app application are URL parameter. You can actually change them. You can actually change them in the URL of the browser, okay? You should be able to see URLs with parameters in the browser. Like, you know, at the URL address, you should see param equals value. You can change it here, okay? So go to the virus payments right now and see what you can find. 